Moving finally to Apple Maggot, I would first note some principles underlying the recommended management approaches for this pest. Firstly, it's assumed that most commercial apple orchards generally do not have internal infestations of apple maggot since they tend to overwinter in wooded areas or unmanaged plantings. Therefore, maggot management programs are designed to control flies as they immigrate into the orchards from those outside sources. Now, historically, broad spectrum organophosphate insecticides were extremely effective in controlling apple maggot, although currently most of these products have disappeared from the market. It would be nice if there weren't so many alternate hosts available near commercial orchards where maggot populations can build up. But unfortunately, it's normally not possible to remove all potential apple maggot hosts in close proximity to commercial orchards. Although in situations where it is possible, improved control can be obtained by removing all apple and hawthorn trees within about 100 meters of the borders of a commercial block. We do know that not all apple varieties are equally susceptible to maggot attack. Softer, earlier ripening varieties are most preferred for apple maggot overposition and favorable for larval survival such as Ginger Gold, Jana Gold, Gala, Max, Wealthy, and Cortland. The harder late ripening varieties are least preferred. Varieties such as Rome, Red and Golden Delicious, Fuji, Brayburn, Ida Red, and Mutsu. This shows the progression of apple maggot monitoring traps used over the past 40 years or so, starting with the baited yellow board sticky trap then progressing to a fruit mimic. This one, a uh, red wooden sphere, much like a croquet ball, and ending up with our current standard, which is a disposable plastic sphere that often has a fruit volatile bait associated with it. The late 80s marked a transition period in the monitoring and management process for apple maggot in New York. Before then, most growers relied on a preventive calendar-based spray schedule that started pretty much as soon as the first apple maggot fly was caught on a yellow board trap. The unbaited red sphere started being adopted in the late 80s in 1980 in, in New York, and it also had a, a one fly threshold, but this trap was much more effective than a yellow sticky board at catching the earliest arriving apple maggots in the orchard. Then, after the work done by researchers like Ron Prokeby and Harvey Rising, the volatile baited sphere traps became much more widely adopted, along with a higher threshold of five per trap. This is one of the only tree fruit insect examples I know of where a trap catch number is directly related to a threshold treatment decision. Now, the use of these monitoring programs is based on some general assumptions. First of all, that apple maggot traps are attractive only over a relatively short, short range, say 20 to 25 meters. So they don't really draw them in from areas that normally wouldn't serve as a source of infestations. Also, protective residues from an insecticide control spray will last only 10 to 14 days under typical New York summer conditions. Naturally, this protocol is not necessarily followed precisely all the time, and there are some common deviations, we'll say, that we're aware of being practiced, such as using apple maggot traps only to time the first spray, with additional sprays being applied at some regular interval, regardless of trap catch. This is actually not much of an improvement over the calendar spray approach, and usually results in application of more sprays than are needed. In some cases, the entire farm's apple maggot management program is based on catches in one or two monitored blocks. This is potentially risky since we know that trap captures can vary quite a bit among different plantings. So this practice can result in some blocks getting fewer sprays or more sprays than they actually need. And finally, sometimes the recommended treatment threshold of five flies per trap is not observed and applications are made whenever there's a convenient spray window or maybe when intuition is allowed to determine spray timing. 
This practice begs the question of why traps are being used at all, since it doesn't take advantage of the research that was done to develop the monitoring guidelines.